English is spoken by a lot of people. I'm fairly happy with the estimate that there are about 500 million people who use it well to do things um, on a weekly basis perhaps and about 500 million more who are using it to some extent. And that's just a rough estimate, but it situates us in the world. This means that English is more important um, than the numbers of uh, native speakers given, for example, for Chinese. Uh, people using English are doing it to uh, uh, produce and move cultural products around the world and to engage in economic relations on a, on a bigger scale. And I believe, for the same reason, perhaps more important than Spanish, which may indeed have more L1 speakers but not as many L2 speakers or, or users of it as a lingua franca. Now, how did English get to that exceptional world status? Um, the wrong answer is to say because it's so good. That is, because it's so logical in its internal structure or so well adapted to commercial usages, uh, which you know, is just not the case. It's one of the more illogical of contemporary European languages in its spelling, for example, and uh, exceptional grammatical structures. So it's not really a good language uh, for use as a lingua franca. However, it is there. It has attained that status. So how and so why? Um, if you look around, you'll find that in the time of Shakespeare, that's 400 years ago, it was a language of five to seven million people. That is not many, about the population of Catalonia were speaking English. So the growth has been spectacular and enormous in a relatively short period. What are the possible answers? Well, the first obvious answer is uh, that the British Empire had lots of colonies around the world and there were lots of people in those colonies and they were all made to speak English. Um, and that is a very real reason because there are many, many countries, uh, post-colonial countries, ex-British Empire countries, where English has been retained uh, as an official language uh, for a, a, a fairly um, interesting local logic in many cases uh, because it's not a local language. It's useful as a national language. Um, in India, you have, over the whole of territory, uh, the use of Hindi and the use of English as uh, national languages, languages spoken over the extent, official languages, I should say. Hindi, however, is, is, is closer to some people's L1 and is therefore a sign of potential domination of one group over another. Uh, something similar could be said of Swahili. Um, in West Africa. Uh, English in those situations has the advantage of being nobody's property, of being uh, equal in its distance or equal in its post-colonial relation of power. Uh, so there is that logic for a certain retention of English in the former colonies and that certainly boosts the number of L2 speakers and of, of use of English uh, outside of the colonial metropoli, metropolises. However, the, the colonial theory doesn't explain everything. Um, for example, we would expect the same thing to have happened uh, for Spanish, which had extensive colonies. And perhaps we could look at French as a colonial language and before that at Portuguese as a colonial language and ask, well, why hasn't the same thing happened? Why haven't those languages developed uh, so many uh, L2 speakers or, or users of the language as a lingua franca. There must be something else in it. The next frequent answer is the um, economic power of the United States in the 20th century. The United States is the winner of, of, of the Second World War. Uh, the United States as inserting cultural, asserting cultural hegemony on a global scale. And that's probably a good answer, except that if you look at the kind of English being used around the world, uh, remarkably little of it outside the United, of the United States is American. 
the varieties that we find uh, tend to take their lead from um, the colonial image of British English, from the prestige varieties of British English, or from their own national varieties as they have evolved. You do not find around the world American English being the model for all Englishes. So I don't think direct cultural or economic hegemony is a sufficient explanation of what's happening with the varieties of English. Also, if we follow that argument, we would expect there to be just one English being used around the world, whereas what we're going to see is that there are, in fact, many, and they, 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 the use of variation uh, is, is, uh, is, is still quite dynamic. There is not a tendency uh, towards um, everybody using American English, as far as I can see. I think other answers have to be looked for in history. Uh, in our textbooks in this course, and, and the videos that you're asked to see, you'll find people referring to a strange phenomenon that, that, that happened in England um, and, and in influenced uh, the whole of the United Kingdom, um, the development of the public school system, which meant that a prestige class-based variety of English was developed in a way that was not based on regional location, taking young boys and putting them in schools separate from where they learnt their L1 enabled a certain social class, the dominant social class, to develop a variety, RP, received pronunciation, whatever you want to call it, uh, or public school English. And this gave the language the prestige of class and the prestige also of non-regionalism. Uh, English has carried with it through its colonial and post-colonial history a certain prestige that is non-regional. And this connects very easily with the post-colonial needs um, of countries that, 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 that want a lingua franca, they don't want it to be regionally based, and they want it to have that prestige of culture from the past, culture uh, from the, the previously dominant power perceived to be no longer threatening. Uh, that sort of dynamic has a lot to do with the success of English. Not that it is now powerful, or the language of powerful countries, that would be the United States, but that it is relatively powerless and has this aura of prestige from the past, which might be the presence of the United Kingdom. It's like Greek within Roman culture. Uh, uh, Greek attained prestige at the uh, Greek language, Greek culture, at the moment when uh, it was no longer an economic or political or military threat. The final reason, I think, has to be this, that, that certainly since the 1970s, 1980s, there has been a process of economic globalization where economic relations are no longer based or controlled by the nation state, and that the needs of communication in the age of globalization were such that it was important to have just one language being used as a lingua franca. Uh, the use of a lingua franca, it's like having a mobile phone. Uh, the more people who have it, the more useful it is, the better it is, or any means of communication, a fax or whatever. Uh, so the more people have the lingua franca, the better it is, and the more it's going to be used as a lingua franca. And if you get that logic, you have to look at whatever language in the 70s and 80s, 60s if you like, but 70s and 80s, whichever language in the world had a slight lead, had a slight advantage, was very quickly going to attain an enormous advantage because of the logic of lingua francas. And I think English has benefited enormously from that simple economic logic. The fact that as a, ling a lingua franca, one language had to be the one, and it just happened to be slightly ahead at the age when that logic kicked in. So we have three reasons, I think. Uh, colonization, this particular, particular non-regionalism of English, and the needs of li a lingua franca in an age of globalization. Uh, I'm sure you and others can find many more. <laughs>